Hey everyone, this is Michael from Up and Running Tutorials, and in this video, we'll explore traditional approaches to writing CSS, like inline styles, vanilla CSS, SAS, and post CSS, and walk through how each one works in a Gatsby project. So, we've created a new Gatsby project using the default starter, and we've opened it in VS Code and started Gatsby's development server so we can see our project in the browser. If you're not sure how to get to this point, check out the link in the description below to an earlier video where we walk through how to start a new Gatsby project. Assuming you've done that, let's talk about how to write CSS in Gatsby. If you're new to React and Gatsby, you'll be learning lots of new JavaScript concepts and changing how you write your HTML, so to stay productive and avoid feeling too overwhelmed by how many new things you're learning, it may be nice to just keep writing your CSS however you're used to writing it. So let's take a look at some of the traditional approaches and how they work in a Gatsby project. One of the most basic ways of writing traditional CSS is using inline styles. So here in the index.js file in the pages folder, we can see an example where the default starter is using a style attribute here on this div that surrounds the image. Inside the style attribute, we can see that there are a couple default styles being applied, and we can see that the JSX syntax differs quite a bit from the HTML syntax. So when writing inline styles, the first thing to notice is that rather than writing the value of this attribute as a string, we write it as an object. You'll notice that the styles are surrounded by two layers of curly braces. If you're new to React, that might look kind of weird. The reason there are two sets of curly braces is that the outer ones simply indicate that whatever's inside them should be interpreted as JavaScript. And then the inner curly braces are used because we're writing a JavaScript object, which is always surrounded by a pair of curly braces. So because the contents of the style attribute are a JavaScript object, we use this camel casing to write each CSS property. If the value of the property is a string, you wrap that string in quotes. The default starter is showing that you can use backticks as the quotes, but you can change these. You can use single quotes as well. That would work just fine. That just automatically changed to double quotes when I saved it. That works just fine as well. So any type of quotes are fine. However, what you can't do is to just write a string and not surround it by quotes. This would be interpreted as a number followed by something JavaScript can't interpret. These quotations are only needed for string values if you are passing in a value that's just a number. For example, if I were to say line height uh, 1.5 or something like that, and there's no unit attached to this, you don't have to surround numbers in quotes if you wanna just pass them as a numerical value. Just remember anytime you're combining a number with a unit, that needs to be passed in as a string and surrounded by quotes. You'll also notice that because this is an object, each declaration is separated by a comma. This is different than what you're used to with CSS, where each declaration is separated by a semicolon. So you just switch to using all the syntax rules that apply to JavaScript objects. One nice thing about using JSX is that you have more options than you have with HTML for ways you could refactor this to make it nicer to read. One of those is that if you'd like, you can extract this object and save it to a variable. So I could come up here and say, for example, wrapper styles equals, and then I could pull Pull out this object, save it here, and then just put the name of the variable here. Now we've taken away some of the noise from the actual return statement, which I often like to do, so that if we want to look into the details of what these inline styles are, we can come up right here and take a look. But if we want to focus on the overall structure of this markup, we can move them out and then just place the variable names here instead. As you can see, we now only have one set of curly braces on the style attribute. This is different than before where we saw two sets of curly braces. This is simply happening because now one of those sets of curly braces is stored in the wrapper styles variable. So when we're just passing in the object as a variable, we only need the outer curly braces which say interpret these contents as JavaScript, in this case, as a variable. So even though we're writing our inline styles using this object syntax, in the browser they will be converted back into a normal string like you're used to seeing in HTML. So if I go to the browser and open up the DevTools and then navigate in, I'm just going to open these elements up. I'm going to scroll down here 
And then here are the inline styles that we've been editing. You can see that even though they're written as an object right here, they've been converted to a normal CSS string over here using this kebab casing with the hyphen in between words, using the semicolon to separate declarations. So once our styles make it to the browser, they're written in the normal way the browser expects to see them. You just need to remember that when you're authoring them in React, you need to write them as an object rather than a string. So that's how you write inline styles using React. Although inline styles are simple to write and it's nice that they are scoped to the part of the markup where they occur they don't affect anything outside of that all the same disadvantages apply to using them in react as you would be used to from your previous projects which means with an inline style you can't use media queries you can't use pseudo selectors like detecting hover uh, these styles won't be cached by the browser so inline styles still shouldn't be your main way of writing CSS CSS. They'll be useful in some cases, like for animating individual styles, but in general, any other approach to writing CSS is going to be a better choice than inline styles. So let's take a look now at writing standard traditional CSS in CSS files. The Gatsby default starter has an example of traditional CSS in use in the layout.js and layout.css files. So let's navigate to the components folder and then open up layout.js and layout.css. So we can see that the layout.css file contains normal CSS. There's nothing different about how this CSS is written. The syntax is exactly the same. So if you're used to writing CSS in this way, the original traditional way of writing CSS, you can continue to do so. In order to apply these styles to have the browser load them, you do something a little different in React than you're used to with HTML. Rather than creating a link tag in the head of your HTML document, you instead import the CSS file in whatever component should use those styles. The import statement is simply the word import followed by a space, and then you write the relative path from the file you're in to the CSS file. So in this case, if I open the sidebar, we can see that the layout.css file is in the exact same folder. So it has the same path as the layout.js file we're in. So that's why it starts with this period, which means start from the current folder, and then it just provides the name of the file. And because this is not a JavaScript file, it's important to include this .css extension at the end. When no extension is included, like in this import statement above, React assumes that the extension is .js. That's because most imports will be other JavaScript files. If you're not importing a JavaScript file, it's very important to specify what type of file it is. So just to show you that this is working, let's go over to the layout.css file and let's just change something so that we can confirm that this CSS file is being loaded. If I just write something simple like background color pink on the body and save, we can see immediately, first of all, isn't that nice that Gatsby hot reloads any changes we make? We don't have to refresh the browser. That never gets old. And we can also see that any CSS we write in this .css file is going to be immediately applied to the body. So this works just as you're used to. All you need to do is import that file and Gatsby takes care of loading it for you. Now, one of the things that's even nicer about writing traditional CSS in Gatsby is that you don't need to write your CSS in one long giant file. In fact, it's far better not to. One of the ways that Gatsby helps your site to load as quickly as it possibly can is that it inlines all of the styles for the current page in the head of the HTML document. This practice is known as critical CSS and it dramatically speeds up how quickly your page will load in the browser. So because Gatsby is placing all of your styles in line, there's no longer any advantage to combining all of your styles into one giant file. That was only helpful with traditional websites that needed to wait for your CSS files to download, in which case only having to download one file was faster than having to wait for many files to download. Since there's no longer any waiting or downloading when using Gatsby, you're free to break your CSS up into as many small readable files as you like. And generally a good way to go about it is to create a CSS file for each component. Gatsby will decide what CSS it should inline in the head of your document based on what components are rendered on the page and if they import any CSS files. Because the index page uses the layout component and this layout component imports this CSS file, Gatsby will therefore inline these CSS declarations in the head of the index page. So let's practice creating our own CSS file just so we can see how this works. 
So if I open up the sidebar here, we see we have a separate header component. So why don't we create a header.css file to go along with it? I'll type header.css. And then again, this is just a normal CSS file. So I'll just create a class, I'll call it title, and then I'll come up with some kind of styling. Why don't I make the font size larger? Let's say font size six rem and save. Okay, so I have a CSS file here, but it's not affecting anything yet because I haven't imported this CSS file into any of my components. So if I go over to header.js and import our new CSS file, import, and then I'm gonna say from the current folder, import header.css and save. There are still no styles applied simply because we haven't applied the title class to any of our elements. So let's go down to our H1 and we'll attach the title class to this element. And remember that in JSX, we use the word class name instead of class to avoid a naming collision. So I'll say class name equals title and save and boom. Okay, not the most subtle styling in the world, but you can see this is working now. And it's very similar to the approach you might be used to if you're used to writing traditional CSS, meaning that you give an element a class using the class name attribute you create the definition of that class in a css file and then you're going to load that css file by importing it in the component that uses it gatsby lets you continue to use the same approach you've used in the past while also adding some extra optimizations for you like inlining the critical css so that your page loads as quickly as possible so i'm going to remove this title class for a moment here just because it looks totally bizarre so what if instead of writing traditional CSS, you've been used to writing SAS? If you're not familiar, SAS is a preprocessor that adds powerful features like variables to your CSS, and it's been quite popular for the last number of years. While Gatsby comes with built-in support for using .css files, if you'd like to use SAS or another preprocessor, you'll need to install a plugin that adds that functionality for you. So to do that, I'm going to navigate to the gatsbyjs.org homepage. And then in this narrow view, the menu is down at the bottom. I'm going to go to the plugins page. You might see it at the top if you're visiting this page on a larger screen. Once I'm on the plugins page, I can search for any plugins I might need. So for adding a CSS preprocessor, if I were to use less, for example, that's another one, I would search for less and then see here Gatsby plugin less. So if you'd like to use less, there's support for that. You'd click on that and follow the instructions. If you've been using Stylus, you can search for Stylus and you'll see again, there's a plugin that allows you to use Stylus with Gatsby. We'll use SAS as our example because it's by far the most popular preprocessor. And you can see here when you search for SAS, you get Gatsby plugin SAS as one of the results. And look how popular this thing is, 170,000 downloads so far. So let's click on this plugin here, and this will take us to the instruction page. And there are basically two instructions that you need to follow. One is to copy and paste this command into your terminal and run it. This will add the packages that Gatsby needs to make SAS work. And the other is simply to list the name of this plugin as one of the plugins in your Gatsby config.js file. After that, you'll see some additional instructions that are all related to special options that you don't need by default. So read on if you wanna really customize how you're using SAS with Gatsby. But if you'd just like to use it in the standard way, we're just gonna follow these first two instructions. So I'm gonna copy this install command and then go to the terminal, which is currently running our site. I'm gonna stop that by hitting control C. I'm going to paste in this install command and I'm going to run it. And while that is running, I'm going to go to our Gatsby config file and I'm going to edit the plugins array. All we need to do is at any point in this array. So I'll just go after this first line. We just need to add the name of this plugin, which is Gatsby plugin SAS. And then just to make sure we've added a comma at the end of this line so we don't break this object and then give that a save. Okay, and then once the plugin has finished installing, I'm going to restart the dev server by typing Gatsby develop. And once the dev server has finished starting up, I'm going to take another look in the browser at our site to make sure it's working. And there we go, our dev server is back up. And now our project should have support for SAS. So to test that, let's open our sidebar here. And then what I'm going to do is duplicate our header.css file and then rename the copy header.scss. So we're now writing SAS. And just to test that this is being read as a SAS file and not as a CSS file, let's add something here that wouldn't work in normal CSS like nesting. So I'll target any anchor that's inside the element with the title class and say that 
that it should have a background color of something really pretty, like plain orange. And I'm gonna give this a save. We're not currently using these styles anymore, so let's change that. I'm gonna go to the header.js file, and rather than importing the header.css file from this folder, which is here, I'm gonna change that and now import the header.scss file from the same folder. So notice that I'm just importing the SAS file directly. We don't have to process it ourselves and then import a CSS version. You can just directly import the SAS file and Gatsby will handle the rest. So I've imported the SAS file. Now let's apply the class we created, which was title, and give it to save. Ta-da! <laughs> so beautiful. Okay, I'm going to close the sidebar and go back to header.scss so we can take a look at what's happening here. We've applied our title to the h1 element and it has successfully bumped up the font size to 6 rem. And then there's a link inside that h1 and it has given it a background color of orange. This confirms that SAS is actually working because we've nested this declaration inside of this one, which would not work in vanilla CSS. Let's say you prefer when writing SAS to use .sass files, the other syntax for SAS. I'm going to take this file and duplicate it, and then I'm going to rename the duplicate header.sass instead of scss. Okay, at this point we need to change the syntax. It has no curly braces, so we're just basically going to remove those. It also has no semicolons. Okay, so here is our sass syntax file. Let's go to header.js, and instead of loading the s CSS file, let's load the SASS file. Again, we're just loading the SAS file directly. We're not processing it or compiling it beforehand. If I save it, nothing should change. And there we go. So if you like to use SAS or another preprocessor, this is how you go about it. So besides vanilla CSS and SAS or other preprocessors, the other main way of writing traditional CSS involves using post CSS, which is another way to automatically add a lot of features to the CSS you're writing that aren't traditionally supported. By default, Gatsby automatically uses two post CSS plugins to help your CSS. It uses the auto prefixer plugin to add some prefixes to your declarations that might be needed in some of the oldest browsers you're supporting. And it also automatically uses the Flexbugs post CSS plugin to rewrite some of your Flexbox styles in a way that will be less likely to break in certain cases. If you'd like to add even more post CSS plugins to your project because you're used to using them or you'd like to try them out, out, you can absolutely do that. You follow the same basic approach as we did for adding SAS support, meaning that we're going to go to the Gatsby plugins page. I'm going to go back here and here we are in the plugins directory. And instead of searching for SAS, I'm going to search for post CSS. And you'll see the very first plugin that comes up is Gatsby plugin post CSS. This is the one you want generally rather than this one below it. So we go to the post CSS plugin and we can see it has very similar instructions. Copy this command and run it in your projects directory add the name of the plugin to your Gatsby config file. And from there, you can load specific post CSS plugins in one of two ways. You can either do it in your Gatsby config file by copying this approach right here and listing your post CSS plugins in this array, or you can place a post CSS.config.js file in the root of your project and then list your plugins like this. Either way works, so if you have PostCSS plugins you'd like to use, just follow these instructions to implement them in your project. We won't actually run through this example ourselves because it works very similar to how we got SAS up and running. So that's how you can continue to use traditional CSS approaches. They all still work with Gatsby and will allow you to keep writing CSS the way you're used to while you focus on learning Gatsby and building your React skills. With all of these traditional CSS solutions, you'll need to continue to watch out for the same issues you've likely encountered on your earlier projects. These issues include naming conflicts and issues with specificity where some declarations are overriding other ones, and also issues where eventually it becomes difficult to know whether it's safe to delete some of the CSS you've written because you're not sure how many parts of your project might be relying on those styles. In the next video, we'll explore some newer ways you can write CSS in a React project, known as CSS in JS, that automatically solve these issues with naming and specificity and removing unused CSS. Until then, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.